Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining uh, our webinar today on behalf of myself and on behalf of the whole ATS. I'd like to welcome you for joining our webinar that we have entitled the Hitchhiker's Guide to ATS and specifically to ATS Conference. Uh, my name is Mirum Mara. I serve as a fellowship program director for pulmonary and critical care medicine, adult pulmonary and critical care medicine at University Hospitals and Case Western in Cleveland. And I am a member of the ATS training committee. So after two years of being virtual, we're all very excited to go back to a, an ATS conference in person. But we also recognize that a lot of the trainees may be going for the first time in person. So that being a large conference uh, might be a little bit overwhelming. That's why we thought maybe having a webinar on how to navigate the conference might be uh, of value to people. So thank you very much for joining. We will be recording this. We will be posting it shortly afterwards for the people who could not, who could not join. Uh, and I'm very lucky to have a great group of panelists today that is helping bring in their expertise. So I'm going to take a minute to introduce them. So I'll start with Dr. Uh, Kristen Burkhart, and she is a professor of medicine at Columbia University, where she is the fellowship program director. And her main focus is medical education, and she actually is the uh, ATS training committee chair. Uh, next is Dr. Christine Bojanowski, and she is an assistant professor at Tulane University, where she also is the associate program director, and she is a great example of a physician scientist. So she'll be bringing to us the uh, research experience aspect of the conference. Uh, and last but not least, Dr. David Chu, and he is an assistant professor of medicine at Penn State and is currently the fellowship program director in there as well. Uh, his clinical interests include uh, pulmonary hypertension and diagnostic care ultrasound, and he'll be providing like a clinical perspective on attending the international conference today. So this is that we have the medical education, the research aspect, and uh, the research aspect kind of covered from different from different angles. So hopefully it would make for a great discussion. Uh, please feel free to write any questions that come to mind in the chat box. We have a few questions that we've thought through uh, over last week. I think to just make to keep the conversation going. But if you have more questions, please type them in the chat box as well. Uh, before we get started, if you don't mind, I'm just going to make it a little bit more interactive. If you don't mind typing in the chat box, say, why do you like to go to an ATS conference? Like, what is the main goal of going to the, attending the conference and spending the time in there? What are you hoping to accomplish with that, uh, with that conference? So we'll just give people a minute to maybe type a few, uh, a few comments. And then hopefully the answers will have try to address those needs or those goals for the for the conference. Hey Maroon, I also had another idea. Wonder if um, we can also ask them to put in questions like what are so what what are their goals and hopes, but like what are their maybe concerns or what are their sort of biggest questions about ATS? Um, sure. Is that okay? Yeah. So I was gonna do the goals first and then once we start with oh. the questions, put the questions the, the questions afterwards. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so I think it's it's all good. I'll try to screen through the the comments and then pick pick which and which. <laughs> So, so far we have learning, networking, learning about new research in my field and networking, sharing with others, learning from others. I'll translate my research into the clinical field. I think that is great. So those are great goals. So when we, when we ask people the most common, like when I ask our fellows in our program and the most common things that people say is like, one, I want to like learn about new discoveries, new guidelines, new techniques, things that come up from a clinical perspective, that that is the learning, um, learning aspect. Um, and some of the, you guys mentioned that share some of the work that you've been working on, whether it's in, in research and other, and other things. Uh, maybe it's meeting up with some people you've already known and have known from before, or also meeting new people with similar interests and potential collaboration for the future. And one that we also would love to include in there is uh, being more involved in APS and how being a member and being part of the society and then uh, even bringing more opportunities to participate. Um, just kind of the, I wish we had a poll because I would have been, I would have loved to learn who has actually of the people who join are actually faculty and who are the ones that are actually trainees and fellows in training. And I think we have a mixture, um, a mixture of both, of both in there. Uh, so hopefully we'll try to address a little bit of the needs and goals of, of both groups. Uh, although this is mainly focused on the, on the trainees and the fellows in training who are attending, attending the conference. 
So learn more about practice of pulmonology, about research. Some of the concerns is getting overwhelmed by a broad spectrum of scope of the conference. I think that is that is the most common things that that come up is it's this is a large conference and there's a lot that's going on at any given at any given time and it can be overwhelming for everybody. Um, so I think that is a great first question to start with. That is actually at the top of the list of the things we we have talked we have talked about. Uh, so the first question we're gonna try to we're gonna put to the panel is how to avoid feeling lost and overwhelmed by everything that is going on in the conference. Uh, Christy, I'll start with you. Um, so I think that is probably one of the most common questions um, that we actually talk about and ask, and I try and help our fellows navigate. Um, so there is pre-conference information that I highly recommend people looking at and actually sort of either partnering with your mentor. So if you're at a place, again, I don't know where, we don't know who everybody is on this call, but I would say one of the most important things is actually planning for the conference is sort of taking a look at that sort of conference agenda before you get there. Um, I know Maroon, you're going to sort of walk people through this a little bit, but there's um, a lot of roadmaps that have been put together to help people guide their way through the conference. There's been a lot of work from the, um, the MIT committee, which David's on. Um, and it breaks it down by clinical interests, by research interests, um, but also sort of early career professionals, which I think is a great starting place for everybody. And so when I advise fellows or um, early faculty or people um, that are coming to the meeting for the first time or for the 10th time, um, I would say, take the time to review um, the sort of ATS program before you get there meet and sit down um, with your, pro your, either your program director if you're not yet doing research with somebody or your mentor if you're doing research and sort of saying, all right, what areas, where should I be, where should I be targeting my focus? What is the best high yield areas for me to go and to, um, to talk to people, to meet people? It's sort of part of that networking that we sort of will we'll expand a little bit more into, but but there's a great spaces within that um, ATS that are gonna be knowledge gaining and networking, and they often go hand in hand. And so really sort of pre-planning is an important part of this um, preparation for ATS. And so it really is doing the work. And there's a lot of, you're gonna, I will tell you right now, so mentally prepare for this if it's your first time going to ATS, you are going to miss out on some things and you're gonna be bummed because um, there's always, in my opinion, I have at least two things that are always going on at the same time um, that I want to attend. And I think I, and I still do this. I'll tell you what I still do. And I still think it's a poor choice. And we'll see what the other panelists say. I still then go, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go to like the first part of this, because this is the part that I really want. And then I'm going to run to the other side of the convention center, because it's always on the other side of the convention center and try and hit that sort of second part of it. And it never, I never time it well, and it never actually works out the way I want it to work out. So um, committing to, to one session is probably my best advice, despite me, me still trying to do this. So I say, do as I say, not as I do, but I, I would pre-plan, I would go to the, um, and I, uh, Maroon, you're going to walk through that sort of early career yes. professionals roadmap, right? So yes. that is your best friend, but it also takes time. You need to get on the app when it gets up there, look at the programming, filter sort, and sit, take the time to sit down with your mentor and or program director to sort of pre-identify what areas you want to go to, whether it's a symposium, um, I'll talk about why I think the poster um, sessions are some of the most valuable things that um, you can attend and they're like the lowest sort of um, splash in terms of news media type stuff, but I think they're probably the most valuable place to go and meet people and we can talk a little bit more about that, but that's the sort of 30,000 foot view to the, that approach. So I think preparing ahead of time uh, and looking through at the conference, so don't get there without having kind of had a plan. I mean, obviously you can adapt while you're there, but having at least a tentative plan on some of the sessions. Uh, David, what do you what are your thoughts in general? And then we'll go into the specifics of people's interest in clinical and research and medical education uh, in a little bit. And uh, Christy, when we finish up the discussion, I'll pull up the uh, mid thing and then put it as a summary of checklist for people that they can take home with them and hopefully use to their advantage. David, what what do you what what do you think? I certainly will echo um, some pre-planning here it makes a lot of sense because um, when you get there, they'll, you know, as part of your welcome packet, you also get, if you haven't looked at it yet, you'll get a, a book that's basically being scheduled the conference and it is basically a phone book. Um, so if that's your first time kind of looking at it, it'll be very overwhelming, um, but it's, you know, nice to have the physical copy too. But a lot of this is available online beforehand. And so you can take some time, you know, before you actually arrive 
Um, I think, you know, it's really important as some of you have identified, you know, you have that you have a specific goal, like the more specific your goal is, the more you're going to be able to get out of the conference and the easier it is to figure out sort of like which sessions you want to attend and things like that. So if your goal is networking, like thinking about like, what are the, what are the things that you can attend that will actually help with that and like networking in what networking in you know, people doing similar research as to what you're doing in a clinical area that you're interested in doing. So for example, like, you know, as, as uh, Marie mentioned, my interest is in pulmonary hypertension. And so, you know, I think the poster sections actually are really nice for that because, uh, you know, a few years back when um, Uptravi first came out and people were talking about trying to transition off from like IV therapy to oral therapy, it was like, I'm curious how people are doing this. And there were plenty of posters that year about like, okay, well, here's how I did it. Here's our experience. And not only is it just like, okay, here's the data they're presenting, but like you get to talk to the person, right? Like you get to talk to people one-on-one, -on -one. it's very easily easy to ac access them. And so those are great, great sessions for the networking part of it, but you have to know which ones are going to be high yield for what you want. So the better you can kind of set those goals up up front, the easier it is to kind of navigate all these things. There are always going to be a billion things going on that you're interested in. And the more you can kind of drill down to like, what are the, trying to keep things like together in terms of like having a few goals rather than trying like, oh, I want to see as much as possible. I think it makes it easier that when you leave the conference, you actually have something to take away from it because it's really easy to be like, I'm going to look at a little bit about IPF and I'm going to look a little bit about like ILD. I'm going to look a little bit about sleep and because there's all these sort of new things and interesting sessions about them, but then you come back and it's a little bit harder to kind of integrate that data later on. And it just can be very overwhelming trying to go from place to place. So I think my biggest take home has always been, you know, be as specific as you can, like in terms of what you're going to try to get out of the conference while you're there. And I think that'll help you in terms of navigating the, the thousands of sessions that, that you have to kind of decide among when you're, when you're actually there. I like it. I think it's so, so far we have sit with your program director and your mentor, put your goals and then prepare ahead of time. So you'll be, we'll be ready to meet some of the goals. Something that you're not going to be able to do all of them then maybe narrowing down the focus so you'll be able to get to the most high yield conferences for you. I mean, it, Christy's way of getting as many steps as you can is also valuable, but they're maybe not, not the best for me <laughs> meeting the goals. Uh, I, I, Christy, Christine Budinowski, I'm going to go with Christine for this conference, just for the confusion. I know you go with Christy as well outside of this, but is that okay? Of course. Thank you. So but what, do you, what do you like to add? So I have a couple of things to add, but one thing I wanted to do, um, Lauren Lynch from our from ATS is incredible and actually pulled together a quick poll. So I thought that might be this might no, be a good. I don't even think yeah, that was she's even possible. A miracle worker, because um, we have a pretty big group now, and just to help kind of direct the discussion, maybe we could throw that poll up and see who uh, our audience is, if it's uh, faculty members early or fellows or otherwise. Let me do that. I know how to launch the poll. I didn't even know that it was possible to create it while in the midst of the comp. So that is, that there is great. Thank you, Lauren. This is amazing. Yeah. So while she's kind of pulling that up, you know, um, I have a couple of specific thoughts related to trainees that are interested in translating their research to other people. Um, if it's bench to the clinical sciences someone, or a clinical space, as someone had mentioned in the chat. Um, but I think one of the main points I want to reemphasize up front is Christy's point that she brought about, like, I will tell you the first ATS conferences that I went to, I definitely did the whole thing where I had a million things on my agenda and I was so focused on, I'm going to get to this one session. And then right after this 10 minute talk, I'm going to run down to another hall and get to this other session. And then totally at the end of the day, what I ended up walking home with was a lot of steps and not a lot of absorbed material. And so that is one thing that, um, ATS is amazing. It can be incredibly overwhelming. So I think you just have to go in, making sure that you commit to cutting your losses and pick to focus on a few things. So, um, you know, just a couple of high yield things for you and sit there and be present and try to network and talk with the people that are there. Um, if not, like grab some names so you can email them later. We're all educators. We're all, you know, wanting to share science and share, you know, advancements in pulmonary and critical care. So everyone's up to talking, you know, this is an awesome time. So, um, but yeah, so I think that's just upfront. Definitely, I would just say cut your losses and focus and put your butt in a chair or your 
feet in front of a poster and get the most that you can out of that one, you know, that one interaction, that one block of time. Um, there will be other ATSs for you to go to and other ways to, to connect, um, you know, after the meeting as well. The rest of the stuff we can kind of touch on when it comes, when it's a little bit more appropriate. Talking about. And I just want to reemphasize, because I think both, I sort of briefly touched on it, and I think we'll talk more about it, but you talked about it, Christine, David, you spoke about it, and there's been a lot of sort of comments on this in the chat. Um, I would I would almost capital letter emphasize networking um, for ATS. And, and I think we're going to explore ways to do that and how to sort of help navigate that. But I think as, as you're hearing us talk about how do you make the most of ATS, how do you prepare for ATS, you know, David has awesome, like, sit down and what are your goals? I, I think it would be a, a sort of tremendous loss for anybody if networking is not at least one of those goals um, and sort of trying to figure that out because knowledge acquisition can come in a lot of different ways and there's amazing stuff you're going to learn at ATS, but it's a really unique space from a networking standpoint. And we'll talk more about that, but I sort of wanted to um, sort of highlight that. Thank you for all the people who answered the poll question. I'm going to end the poll and I'm going to share the results. So. Um, we have mostly fellows and a few faculty, and we have about half of the people are attending ATS, ATS for the first time. Uh, and there have, were a couple of comments in the chat box of trainees who are about to join faculty who are also going to ATS for the first time. Exactly. Um, you, got it, Roger, Joe. you got it, <laughs> We got you. Uh, no, so that is, that is great. So kind of getting into a little bit more depth from the general to the little bit specific. So I know that different people networking is going to be important or whatever you want to do but different people want to network within their like their main interest and also focus on their main interest so there are those tracks or there are different uh, different options or different tracks that are valuable to different people based on whether they have like clinical interests research interests medical education interests um so how do, what are some of the tricks trips tricks and tips that people that people have used before to kind of plan. And maybe David, you can start about the clinical and maybe we'll, Christine will talk about the research and Christy will circle back to you at the end for the medical education. Uh, what are some of the highest yields uh, sessions that can people look for uh, or try to find? David, from your clinical perspective. So I think I'll, I'll go back to the idea about the like, you have to have a specific goal in mind, particularly when it comes, if your goal is knowledge, act, if one of those goals is knowledge acquisition, right? A lot of this stuff, you know, one of the nice things about ATS is that in theory, people are presenting stuff, you know, before it gets published. So you're getting to like see stuff earlier than you would if you just sort of waited for it to show up in the journals. Um, but uh, I, I think that that's, you know, some of that's timing and that's nice to get it a little bit early. But I think the biggest benefit is that you actually get to talk to people. You get to ask them very specific questions about like, hey, you were working on this. I have similar interests. Like, hey, tell me, tell me what you're what's what sort of read between the lines here. Like, what are the extra things that are gonna, I'm gonna be able to take back to my own practice, right? Like using that, using the person as a resource rather than just the data that they're presenting, I think is the biggest difference that you get when you attend the conference. So that can take a number of forms, like, you know, again, poster sessions, I think are actually one of the best ways to sort of get that one-on-one -on -one time with people rather than the larger sessions, because, you know, in theory, if the posters are sort of housed by topic and type of research and all of that. So you should be able to walk down one of those aisles and like sort of immediately sort of just glance and see like, okay, here are all these different things that are going on in the area that I'm interested in. And what are the things that I think want to learn a little bit more about and talk to people about that I can potentially bring back into my own practice. You also have the larger sessions, you know, you're going to have the mini symposia um, that are always going to be themed in some type. And those are nice because those are a little bit more sort of formal presentation type. And then of course they always leave time to sort of ask questions. Um, and I think that's, you know, more what people expect, but I think you still have to go into that with saying like, okay, what are, what are the specific questions you're trying to get answered from those sessions? Um, since they are going to be a little bit more structured and you're not necessarily going to get that sort of like, you know, more personal connection that you would get like in some, in like different sessions, like the, like the poster sessions and things like that. Um, I always like a good pro con debate. If it's in the area, I remember, you know, every year there's usually every year, every other year, there's usually one on like pulmonary embolism as, as is, you know, usually the case. Um, and those are always interesting just to see sort of people talk through like the, the different perspectives on more controversial topics and seeing what other people in the room kind of think of it as they bring up their own questions and, you know, trying to take that and synthesize it yourself as you're kind of thinking through that. Um, but again, you know, there's going to be a lot of these sessions and a lot of different topics. So, 
you want to go if you're thinking about this, like trying to figure out what is what it, what are the specific pieces of information you're looking for? What is the what are the specific topics you really want to focus on? Because again, the more you can kind of drill down to that, I think the more you're going to be able to actually take something useful back home rather than just being confused by a billion different things that you kind of attended because they looked interesting <laughs> up front. No, that is that is that is great. Yeah, those pro con debate are always fun to attend. Um, Christine, for people who are most main focus is research, uh, what are some of the highest yield sessions to think about or to look at before the conference? So I will say I can't really answer that. Right, it's so <laughs> difficult because there's such a broad scope of research. So you know the clinical like clinical researchers are not going to be interested in the super high yield basic science core, wet lab related things, or even early translational stuff. So I think um, a couple of comments that I have related to just how to get the most out of ATS from a, when you're trying to foster and work on your research development. One, first and foremost, for anything, you are not gonna mess this up, you guys. Like, don't, you are not gonna, you're not gonna mess up ATS. So this is gonna be great. Just try to stay focused and get a couple of high yield things. You will nail it, it will be fun. <laughs> um, number two, I really do agree the, um, um, that there is an important, um, there is a important, important um, aspect or an important contribution of kind of like pre-leg work before the conference to make sure that you're getting the most out of it. So a couple of things to do, um, as was mentioned before, trying to meet with your research mentor um, or some leaders in the field or at your local institution, if you're interested in maybe pulmonary hypertension or something like that, just seeing what their thoughts are, what sessions they think are the highest yield for that area of your interest. Trying to do that before ATS um, is important and trying to do that probably like two weeks ahead of time, one or two weeks ahead of time. It gets really crazy for everyone while everyone's prepping talks or travel plans or posters. So just keep that in mind. So this is about the time that you should be trying to meet with your mentors. So it's not you know leading up to right before people leave town. Um, Two, you know, based on the research that you've been doing or reading, um, background reading for whatever your projects are, there's some really cool papers, cool, um, you know, researchers. Look on the ATS um, conference website and search by speaker, and you can search by presentation. So I would look up the people that you're interested in learning from or people that have like jumped out or names you, re you recognize from papers. I would look to see if they're giving any sessions, any poster sessions. I would plan on hitting some of what I think is most high yield is actually doing some one-on-one -on -one discussions at poster sessions. It's a very safe space that you're not intimidated. You don't need to get up on a microphone and ask in front of a big crew of people. You can get into some kind of nitty gritty things and definitely it's a better one-on-one -on -one interaction so you can exchange contact information for follow-up questions. Um, if there are bigger names or bigger sessions and you don't ever, you don't feel comfortable going up to the microphone or, or going up after the talk, what I would always do is keep in mind, this is a networking opportunity. It's so important in research as well. So just getting contact information, you can just email people, hey, I caught your talk at ATS. I had some follow-up questions or do you have any advice for me? I'm interested in this. I thought what you do is very interesting and related in this way. So I think that's a couple of things. The other thing I think is really important if you're going into ATS um, with a focus on advancing your research skills and your um, like research development is looking at ATS and your interactions with people at ATS as an opportunity to work on your elevator pitch, right? Your like five minute spiel that will hook people and engage people in what you're interested in, right? So I would work on your elevator pitch beforehand. Um, I would practice that. I would make sure if you're doing a poster or a talk that you're practicing in front of your peers and your colleagues, people that know what you're talking about and people that have no idea what you're talking about um, in your institution to make sure it really is translatable to, to whoever you end up meeting. Um, but the importance of the elevator pitch. There is one session that I think it gets mentioned, um, uh, but one thing I think is actually helpful for whatever type of research you're in um, is the bear cage competition. It is awesome. Um, it is in the Science and Innovation Center. It's on Monday of the conference from 12 to two, the time is already set. 
basically what the bear cage is it sounds terrifying but it's like a shark tank like situation oh, it's terrifying it, it is kind of terrifying. Sounds terrifying but it's terrifying cool. yeah it's cool and so bear is building education to advance research so basically people are able to submit um proposals the top three get selected they end up essentially doing their elevator pitch to a panel of people that are in um, education, in the sciences, in industry. Um, and so, and then they're kind of, their proposals are kind of vetted and they kind of go back and forth. And then you'll see young investigators kind of talk about their research to a wide group of people that are not necessarily researchers in their field, right? So I think that's something to check out just to also get a better sense of elevator pitch and what you, how the importance of an elevator pitch. Um, and then the last thing I was going to say, which is too late for this year, but for ATS uh, or conferences moving forward, is to really leverage your assemblies, right? So any of the assemblies, be it critical care, AII, I'm obviously like a little biased from the AI, I think of the ones I'm, I'm a member of, but... Um, they have mentorship and apprenticeship uh, programs that you can sign up for. So you put in what you're interested in and they will hook you up with a professor level or a faculty member um, you know, from a different institution that would fall in line with you. So they would be another great resource going into ATS to talk about what should I be seeing? What should I be hitting here at the conference, et cetera. So a lot of pre-leg work um, and then trying to not do so much legwork when you're at the conference and, and more elevator pitching, riding the elevator, not running around. <laughs> running around. I love it. Christy, uh, medical education for people who are interested in a medical educator, uh, finishing educator path. What sure, are the conference? I, I will um, I'm gonna talk about question. that. And the peds question, I'll try and address as a non peds person, but I actually, we do have a bunch of pediatric um, rock stars on the training committee. So um, I'll sort of discuss that a little bit also in pizza. So thank you. So from a medical education standpoint, um, I, so I approach the conference similarly as you would if you're doing there for clinical reasons or for research reasons, right? So there's great content out there from a medical education standpoint. So um, if you can arrive a little bit early, there's something called the ATS APCC MPD Peptida session, which is a medical education focused session. Um, that is that is co-created by um, all those three societies, right? So the APCC MPD is the adult sort of association of pulmonary and critical care medicine program directors and PEPTA is the pediatric um, program directors association. And it's really focused on faculty development um, and medical education. And in, it's an awesome opportunity to learn. It's, you'll have great, exciting, um, engaged speakers. It's also a very small venue um, and you're full of um, just people interested in medical education. It's before the conference starts. It's a way to get your feet wet. It's a way to introduce yourself to people, meet the speakers, um, and provides opportunity to see if there's other time that they're available to speak if it, it aligns with your interests, right? And so there'll be both adult and pediatric medical educators at that session. Um, if it's your, um, if you're already coming, it's the same group that does a lot of the resident boot camps. So they'll be running back and forth between the two spaces. But I would, um, I would say that this year, it's a little late for this, but there's opportunities, right? So there's the faculty to fel the fellow to faculty boot camp. There's for people who are going to be um, interested in both teaching at resident boot camps from a medical education standpoint. So um, if you're there and you're early, walk up, introduce yourselves to us. There's going to be leadership teams running around for all those boot camps, and it's just it's everybody is open to meeting people. Um, there's the early career networking event. Um, I highly recommend going to that, whether you're interested in medical education or research or clinical medicine. Um, so attend that section. It's a way, again, people are purposely there to be open, receptive, come find us. We want to talk to you. Um, how can we help you? And then for the same way that I would approach everything else, really sitting down and looking at that schedule. There's a medical education roadmap that you can take a look at. Some of the content on there is like directly related to that, but you're gonna have to look more in depth than that, right? There's more out there than there's there. So the career for um, for the Center for Career Development, there's a specific day set aside. I think it's Tuesday um, where um, they're gonna talk about how do you get promoted as a medical educator and and why that, that career for Center Development, Center for Career Development, I'll never get the words in the right order, is really important. It's an 
tiny little venue where people are just hanging out and sort of walking around. And so it's a nice way to meet people in that field. So um, there'll be symposiums for medical education content that interests you. Um, there will be the times in the um, Center for Career Development that interests you. I highly recommend coming to the sort of pre-meeting at the ATS APCC MPD Peptida session because it really is a unique space to sort of meet people and learn um, from like a phenomenal group of educators. Um, I will be there. So and if you see me, okay, so first and foremost, I like should wear glasses to see long distance. And I would say maybe 50% of the time mm -hmm. I have them on, although I'm better when I go to meetings because I can't <laughs> see the PowerPoint slides. So if you're waving at me and I don't respond and you've met me before, one, just like, please reintroduce yourself, like walk up to me. Um, if there's a particular medical educator you want to meet, and I know that I'm happy to reach out and help sort of connect you with them, um, reach out to your program director. Say, hey, I love the work that so-and-so is doing do you know them? Can you help me set up a meet, right? So, so some of this pre-work is not just figuring out what conference attendance you wanna to go to. It's like finding out who you can reach out to ahead of time and meet with them. And then the last thing you talked about assemblies and the medical education group, we cross all of the assemblies, right? There are educators in every single assembly that's out there, but we do have a section and our section is actually impressively large. We have, um, our section is larger than some of the assemblies, right? So please look to come to the section of medical education meeting because it's yet another space, not only to network and sort of meet people, we actually um, get a lot of ideas thrown out in a, sort of almost like a working group meeting where people get ideas for symposiums for next year to find ways to get you involved in ATS at that sort of programming, submitting idea level and sort of pairing you up with senior people. We can I um, tag along a question to that? I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes. Because if, like you said, for almost half of the people have not maybe been to ATS before, and maybe people know of ATS, but maybe they haven't, I mean, had the chance to know what an assembly is. How is it different than a committee? Mm -hmm. How is it different? Like, can you, uh, would you be able to, like, give us, like, a small I overview or can. a brief overview? Can I do that after I do the PEDS so that Gita, who's been sitting here patiently waiting for some PEDS information I, that I don't give out our pediatric was, colleagues? Absolutely. I think okay. that is a great idea. Fantastic. All right. So um, I would give very similar advice. And I'm sorry, there's a lot of, I, because I think it actually, most of what we do translates across. But so Gita, there's um, a pediatric roadmap. I would definitely take a look at that. Um, I would come to the, if you're interested in medical education, I would come to the ATS, APCC, MPD, PEPTIDA session, right? So generally the PEPTIDA president is going to be there. There's usually other people from PEPTIDA involved there. There is a pediatric assembly, which we'll talk a little bit about from the assembly standpoint. Um, but it, I would say those are the same places. There's a pediatric boot camp, right? So getting involved in sort of reaching out to the pediatric resident boot camp, even if you're not interested in being an educator, it's an opportunity to meet sort of the pediatric sort of um, educators and who are who will have contacts or colleagues and, and, and sort of are milling around space. Like we have downtime. There's times where it's crazy, but then they're sort of just sort of hanging out in this sort of shared space as we're, um, we're working to do those things. I don't know more specific, but is that good? Oh, yeah. Well, no, no, it's a really great place to start. I appreciate you at sprinkling in that extra advice for the PEDS um, perspective. And I was wondering, like these roadmaps, are these things that I can Google, like roadmap? We'll pull, we'll pull them up at the end. Maroon's going to pull them here. up for the end, but if you Google them, they will pull up. Fantastic. Thanks so much. You're welcome. All right. So assemblies versus sections versus committees. I love that I'm like, I'm frantically looking through my papers because I actually don't know. There's either 13 or 14 assemblies. I actually don't know how many assemblies there are, um, but assemblies are your home. Um, you're allowed to um, be a primary, have a primary assembly and up to two additional assemblies on top of that. <clears throat> so um, I have a love for pulmonary vascular disease and I very rarely do anything other than sort of take care for patients. So it's one of my secondary homes. I have a lot of friends who are pulmonary vascular experts. So like I may run into David running around the PH sort of assembly, right? The <laughs> doors are open, right? It's it's a place to go and meet people with um, sort of like-minded interests, right? So um, the assemblies are, there's some of the larger ones are gonna be the critical care assemblies, the clinical problems assemblies, there's the pediatric assembly, um, but there's a, if you go to the ATS website, you can search ATS assemblies and there's a whole list of them. And I would sign up, I would actually identify which assembly most closely aligns with sort of what are your, what's your academic or your career 
where you're focused, your interests, right? Is it, there's, there's a home for clinicians, there's a home for researchers, there's a home for like sort of those split specialties between critical care. Um, the sections um, have not met assembly status and I, without getting into the complexities of how do you actually become an assembly, it's actually, there's a lot sort of that happens behind the scene. Um, assemblies get to help with programming um, at, at the national conference, they get certain sort of elements of that program sections um, fall within assemblies, right? And so um, the BSHSR um, assembly has adopted the section of medical education. So my home is within the BSHSR assembly um, and I'm in that section of medical education, right? So um, there's a genetics and genomics section, right? So, um, so again, those sections also will have meetings at ATS. Um, it doesn't, doesn't, delineate a smaller size or a larger size. It's just sort of different um, sort of ways that people have a voice at ATS and particularly at the national meeting. Um, I think for my personal experiences, the section of medical education is um, an incredibly, um, it's a incredibly engaged group of faculty and fellows um, who are inclusive and open and, and, and actually bring people in like um, you know, in general, as educators, we like just we want to like bring the whole crop up and like bring people here. Right. Um, and so that space is a really great space because it's it's really just sort of one on one. And the critical care assembly is, is is my other assembly that I go to. And that space is giant and it's packed. And I feel like it's like working my way through like. I don't know, I'm in a crowd in Times Square, right? So that one can be a little bit more challenging. So like try and find people specifically that you're looking for, but the assemblies are a great place to meet, talk. Um, they're a social place, an event sort of in the afternoon. Committees um, are smaller. Um, and we, so as the chair of the ATS training committee, um, we are appointed by the executive um, leadership of ATS. And so these are smaller committees, generally of like-minded. So like the ATS training committee is fairly similar, but has some different sort of lens than the members um, for um, transitions and training, so the MIT committee. Um, but there's an education committee, there's a membership committee, so there's lots of committees. And um, the ways to get involved in the committees is there's a portal on ATS that you can sort of log in. I don't, I don't know if it's a login, you have to be in logged into ATS, but look for the portal. And maybe Lauren, if you can easily find it, I don't have it at my side, we can pop it in the link. But it's where you can nominate or have um, self nominate or somebody nominate you to sort of be considered for a committee right we're always looking for people um, to sort of express interest and so um, that the committees are um, not less inclusive but they're not a come um, come one come all to the meeting they're sort of an invited um, appointed group of people who um, really serve as a resource for executive leadership um, of ATS. Just a comment on the committee thing. Like, I, this is my first year actually participating in one of those. So I joined the members in transitions and training committee. And um, it's really like, it's not super burdensome. It's not like, you know, there's, you're expecting a ton of stuff like the first time, your first go around. Like, they, you know, this group is smaller. They introduce you, they give you an overview of like all the projects that are going on and the things that they do. And you get the choice of like, what do you want to get involved in? So it's an, it's a good way, I think, to sort of get introduced to being involved in the ATS. Um, and which I think is also goes to like, helps you when you're navigating the actual conference itself, as you've met all these people, when you've been working on these projects beforehand, and now you're kind of meeting up in person, getting all these things on the ground. And it's just another way to sort of promote that sort of networking aspect of things and just getting to know all the other people that are going to be there. <laughs> I think that's an awesome, awesome advice. I, I recommend trying to get involved. I will say the the opportunities are much smaller for the committees, right? So I, I don't think I would hang my hat on you must get involved in the committee to actually get involved in the um, ATS. I think really the assemblies um, have a lot to do with the national meeting and the programming um, and the leaders of those. When you go to the roadmap, it'll actually list, which is I think the easiest place to, I always struggle when I look at the program to find out where my assembly meeting is and at what time and where my section is. I don't, that's just my own limits apparently, but the roadmap nice, nicely summarizes where each assembly is and what time it is. And so it's a nice way to also look at all the assemblies in one space as you're, if you're trying to figure out what your assembly would be and what you think fits best for you. So I, I think that um, I would always encourage people trying to get as involved, I was, as, as involved as you can, and as long as you say yes to things that you can actually complete, right? So that's always like my little caveat to those things, right? Um, because it's easy for most of us to sort of spread our bandwidth a little too too tight. That is great. On that note, what I would like to do is next is maybe make it a little bit more practical. So we'll pull up the website and then kind of show you where those roadmaps are if you were to do it on your own. I know that Christina has been doing an amazing job putting all of those links in there. 
Uh, but if you didn't download them and you just wanted to like actually put this into action, uh, I'm going to try to share screen and kind of like walk with you a little bit through some of the available resources that are actually online. So this is the conference. And then uh, if you just type in ATS conference 2022, you should be able to come to this link. And there is a program in here. And a lot of the things that we have been talking about are actually under early career professionals. Uh, so if you click in here, it gives you a little sense of some of the available things. And, uh, and there is kind of a little overview of the days and some of the things that are being that are being that have been talked about in types of conferences that are available and that are in there and there as well. Um, not the program at a glance, like just in here towards the bottom, there is um, these roadmaps that we've been mentioning. So there is a roadmap for early care professional, critical care, medical education, pediatrics, pulmonary research, sleep. Um, I am sorry that I do not, oh, here's the pediatrics one. I was gonna say, I'm sorry, I don't know where the pediatrics one is. It's right here, right in the dead center. You know, I'm sorry. Uh, but it, you can also link to them from the roadmap for early career professionals. So if you click on this one, um, you'll have you'll have it. It's a little larger document, it's 20 pages, but mostly the, a lot of the stuff that have been discussed today are under page five. And I think this is this is work that is done by David's uh, committee, the members in train, transition and training. Uh, and it's amazing. It's really great. So there is things to do before ADS, right? So review this roadmap and look at the website have a calendar and there will be an app that will come out for the ATS conference where you can actually don't have to add everything manually to your calendar. So you can use the app, it, which we checked yesterday. It's not available yet, but it will definitely be available before the conference conference starts. So leveraging technology, uh, not my strongest suit, but it's something that definitely is useful. There will be a Twitter uh, also available to the give announcements and things like that. So sign up for assembly mentorship programs. That's what uh, Christine was talking about, and those are very valuable because they can put you in line with maybe some people that have expertise that may or may not be available at your institution that aligns directly with what you want to do. Plan those meetings. Maybe you have some co-residents that match at a different institution that you haven't had the chance to see. That might be a good opportunity to so, say, hey, are you going to ATS? Let's maybe get coffee or get a drink afterwards. Uh, but also preparing your talks, preparing your posters, and this is, I love this one, prepare for success and comfort. It, there's a lot of walking where comfortable shoes uh, would strongly discourage high heels, but uh, there are personal preference. So it will, there will be walking at usually a large conference hall, but uh, so wearing more comfortable and staying hydrated and all that sort of good, good stuff. And during APS, some of the things that were mentioned as well, there is a networking exchange and you can actually link to these from, uh, from here as well. So if you click on this networking exchange, it will give you the time and what it's actually going to be talking about. Um, and if you go back, there is a center for career development sessions. This year, there is a diversity forum and there is a women's forum as well that I think will be outstanding. I can't, I'm looking forward to them as well. And these are the assemblies that Christy have kind of detailed a little bit there, how they're available. And this is, if you click on the link, it would take you to this space. It will tell you what they are. I'm not going to count Christy. There may be 13 or 14, so we're not going to count them, but they're, they're all here and this is their time. So you'll see which ones 14. they are. 14. 14, I was close. I said 13 or 14. You were right. Uh, so this is the, the name of the assemblies. And you can, I think, from here, link to actually what the assembly does and gives you a little summary to see which one aligns best with what you do with the actual room number and the time and date, which seem to be like a mystery looking for it on the websites. But they're available on this page, which I think is a great, is a great resource. Um, and I think even from this, you can actually link to the other roadmap. So say like you've looked at your, because an early career is not really a destination, it's an early career and something else. And if your main interest is pulmonary, critical care, sleep, pediatrics, medical education, it can be a combination of both. You can link to all of, uh, to all of those from here as well. So for example, pediatrics, uh, this is kind of what the roadmap is, it gives you a little bit of a, what are those key sessions and their location, their time. So you can get a look at those and you can have a diverse a little bit more diverse portfolio you don't have to fall into just the one track you can deviate slightly but maybe not all of the tracks because they will overlap in time and their conferences but that is also a great um, a great resource to have to have in there introduce yourself remember to get contact information and get people email would be i think People are looking forward to meeting people at different stages. Um, and I think everybody is welcoming. And like Christy said, everybody have a big smile and are actually genuinely and happily delighted to meet younger people who are uh, who will just progress in their career as they as they go. And they're more than happy to help. 
uh, after ATS, well, it's also some things we touched we touched on and I think are very important, like just making that email afterwards. And like, hey, it was great meeting you over there. I loved our conversation. Um, I just want to remind you of it. And maybe if I have any ideas in the future, would you be so kind as to run them with you or any other form of contact or other conferences in there as well? Uh, there are session proposals for the year after they actually happen in June in there as well. And reach out to the assembly and committees and getting getting more involved. So I think this is a great checklist that kind of summarizes a lot of the stuff that we have we have been talking, talking about. So can I can I add a couple of things? I'm looking through the chat, but before we um, there's a couple of questions on there for us to talk about. I I just want to go back to highlighting a little bit of the, the networking. Um, and I I think that it's so important. Um, and I'm wearing my hat as a program director. I'm wearing my hat as someone who uh, has gone to ATS since I was actually a resident. Um, and as I tell all the trainees, so that was just a few years ago. It wasn't very long ago. <laughs> I've only been going for a couple of years. Um, but the networking happens in the event and it happens outside of the event. And so there's lots of opportunities to have coffee with people. There's lots of opportunities to set up meetings sort of in between sort of sections of like finishing the poster discussions um, or the poster sessions. I love the poster sessions and it is a, a space that is the energy in that room. It's loud and it echoes and it's just this big open hall with all of these posters. And I'm gonna sort of say, for those of you who are presenting posters, um, I, I remember being like, oh, it's just a poster. No, it's a poster. It is probably the best space that you're going to get sort of feedback and comments on how to improve the work that you're doing. You're going to have people that you read about. I mean, I remember my first time there and like my mentor brought somebody over who and I was like, oh, and they, they're, they, they want to talk to you. So like be prepared, like expect people to come up and talk to you in that section because they're going to talk to you about their work and you're going to pick their brain and it's a way to sort of um, meet up with them. So I, I do think that, you know, the, the, the poster sessions don't compete um, with other things. It is really like, take a look at the book. And when there's a, there's a session that you're, that aligns with any of your interests, like go look, walk around, you're going to meet people, get your mentor. My mentor came with me um, and would walk me around and introduce me to people and make sure that I sort of um, had, had that experience. Um, so I would really like, I would focus on the knowledge. I would focus on the content. I would focus on whatever that goal is, but networking should be an integral part of all of that and using those different spaces to, to network and make those connections, both during sessions, after sessions, in between sessions. Um, but um, recognize that ATS is long and exhausting because it's a big convention center and the conference starts early, but the networking often goes late. So um, get sleep before the meeting um, because I usually leave ATS feeling very, very fatigued um, and rejuvenated and having seen colleagues from all over the country that are from different walks of my life that, um, that really bring a lot of sort of great joy to me. Um, there, there were some questions up front about, and I'm trying to remember someone specifically asking, let's see, it was early on. Um, it'll come to me. Um, all right. That was, that was my focus on the networking. Let me see what else comes. I lost my train of thought getting all there was a, there was a question about dress my people. What there you was say? a question about dress code. Oh, dress code. Thank you. Um, so I'll be curious what other people say, What I would say is this, um, I, that I would say at the beginning of the meeting, people are dressier than by the end of the meeting <laughs> is a general sort of rule of thumb. Um, I think researchers who spend a lot of time not taking care of patients often, not always, again, I'm not sort of like making sort of like anything in a disparaging way because I look just like this usually halfway through or a little more casually dressed than perhaps some of the people who are um, sort of um, not like constantly sort of um, not in a patient care environment. But I would, I would say that for the dress code in general, be professional, right? You're gonna wanna, you're gonna be networking and meeting with people. Um, I'm not saying you can't wear jeans, um, but like I don't, I'm a big rich jeans kind of person just to throw that out there. I do not wear my rich jeans to ATS, right? If I'm in a jeans kind of mood for ATS, I'm gonna be wearing nice jeans um, and sort of looking professional in my jeans, but comfortable. Um, if you're presenting, I wear a suit. So you don't have to wear a suit, but people, when you present, when you're a chair, when you have work, when you're at your poster, you're, most people have um, certainly at least business casual on. Um, so it doesn't have to be a suit, but I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't wear jeans to that. That's just my personal preference. I am completely guilty of trying to rock the heels or some dressier shoe than I should on day one. And then I get terrible, terrible blisters. Um, and then I'm in comfortable shoes. Um, there are like some terms that uh, I get made fun of for saying this. 
but it's like business casual or like the term that uh, I get made fun of is snappy cash. (laughs) It's casual, but it's not, you know, you want to be comfortable. Shoes are important um, for that. They're long days. So you want to not, you know, be uncomfortable. And then, um, but uh, yeah, like elevated, elevated, casual, (laughs) business casual. Um, yes. And so that was the, the, was that the comment? Um, that's what I was looking for. I was like, yes, that was the one. Christine, yeah. you want to take a, that? Christine, yeah, there's another so, question, I think, from Roger about being a facilitator or thematic poster. Yeah, yeah, he like brought it up and I, pour, I saw it and then he brought it up again because he didn't want to get lost. So Roger, we got you. So Roger's question was about best practices for being a facilitator for a thematic poster session. So I think that's great. It's going to be one of those things where, um, you're just going to want to go and engage all of the presenters, right? So if this is going to be your first time facilitating one of those discussions, it's kind of tough because people are going to be walking around. You're not going to be grabbing people and trying to pull them over. But I think the big thing is actually just um, engaging with the poster presenter um, in general, letting them, letting them walk you through and letting them do their. So yeah. So I think that's a, I think that's a great example, right? Christine, like, so if if you're looking for like explicit, like, how do you like start that? Um, there, I have, I've, as a poster person and as a facilitator, I've had people approach it in different ways, right? Some people will bring all the presenters together that's standing by their poster and say, hey, this is how I'm going to approach this session. Um, I don't know that that's a necessary step. It works for, for some people, but I certainly um, would say um, best practices would be to introduce yourself to each of the presenters who's standing by their poster, right? Because um, there are sometimes poster sessions that get a little um, late in the, late in the, ATS section where there's not as many people there. So um, you can take the opportunity that if there's not a lot of people milling around, you can bring all the other presenters over and you guys can sort of like hear so that there's somebody besides just you listening and engaging with a poster. But for the most part, what I um, I think is best practice, introduce yourself to the poster person. Um, say, do you want to walk me through your findings, right? If you say walk me through the poster, they may walk you slide by slide. So like, it's always like that sort of caveat, like what you want to get, but like engage in them, let them talk to you about what's exciting about their poster um, and just introduce yourself as the person who's facilitating the session. And if you know somebody that is in your research field or your clinical field or your education sphere, because there is a med ed section for posters as well, which I would go to, um, you can grab them and be like, hey, this person has interest in, in, let me introduce you, right? And sort of help help that person be, I just spilled my drink, but it was empty. It's all good. Um, help them network a little bit. So I think it's just more of making sure people recognize you're there um, and you can help facilitate that sort of session by either hooking up different poster people who are similar work together and be like, hey, so-and-so across the hall is doing the exact same thing or a similar thing. You guys should talk, right? And sort of helping make those connections. And then another thing I wanted to emphasize too, again, this just goes back to what I keep on saying, like, you're not going to mess this up. ATS seems so overwhelming. You're not going to mess it up. And um, it may be intimidating, especially if you're earlier on still in training or early faculty, or this is your first conference, you may just feel and you go to show up into that assembly room or you go into that loud poster room, you know, and you're just like, I'm not. I'm actually not going to say anything. I promise you everyone that's there wants to network. We are all in the same boat. So don't be afraid to talk to anyone. It's a very welcoming space. So it doesn't matter where you are. If you're in residency, if you're a first year fellow, if you are new faculty, if you're a professor, everyone wants to talk. So don't be afraid. Just open your mouth, stick out your hand or your elbow in COVID times and and, uh, just go from there. Yeah, to kind of go off of that, like if you're I'll perfect to be perfectly honest, like I am not the best at networking here. I am very good at like, you know, structured things and things like that. And so for those of you who are, you know, less comfortable kind of putting yourself out there, as you said, I think in general, like people are just very welcoming of new people. And so that should sort of be the baseline here. But if you want a little bit more structure to meeting new people, each of the assemblies has a mentorship program as well that you can apply to be involved with. And generally what they try to do is they'll set up meetings during the conference so that you can meet these people. I think it's really helpful that yes, you may have a mentor sort of at your home institution, but getting outside perspectives on how things are done. So for example, if you're interested in building a clinical program and you know, you know the way that your institution has historically done it, it's good to get outside perspective on how other people do it, how they organize things, you know, just trying to make those connections. And so programs like that exist for people who are less comfortable necessarily going into that like big room area and just kind of 
you know, putting, just trying to put their best foot forward. Um, so there are these, so there are ways to do it, even if, you know, networking may not be your strongest suit. <laughs> I mean, I'm, with, I'm with David. Uh, yeah. I was just going to add uh, the personal experience. I'm, I'm a little bit with David, like people who are more introverted in nature that to be less outspoken in those in those situations. I remember the first time I stood by my poster, I was like, everybody that wants to come in, I play like the hide eye contact. Uh, don't make eye contact. They won't talk to you. Don't make eye contact. They won't talk to you. And it does get better the more that you practice. And I want to just second what Christy is saying. So what David said is great getting the structured, like this is this is kind of your assigned mentor. But I also the, the second the idea that if you know someone who knows someone, that is probably the best way. And I remember the difference when I was there as a fellow with my division chief and my division chief was like, hey, I want to introduce you to this person. He's a fellow in our institution. Um, that was a much more easier to do than to just walk up to somebody I did not know and say like, hi, my name is Maru and I'd like to ask you a question but i mean it's different for different people different on their uh, i'm looking at the clock i want to add two things that i think are really really important concepts here so one is remember your network you have a network all of you have um been at medical school all of you have been in residency and um many of you are now in fellowship right um i your network extends to all those people that you've previously worked with right so there are also great opportunities to reach out to them saying hey i'm going to be at ats um, the people that you really connected with at different parts of your training. I, that's one of the, my favorite things that I do is I reconnect with them. If you're looking to be looking for a job, right? If this is like you're about to sort of go out to hit that workforce, talk to your program director, talk to your mentor, talk to faculty that are sort of either your sort of career mentors or however that actually looks. Ask them to help you make connections. The number of people that I have spoken with who are sort of in that pre sort of looking for job phase that my old program director would be like, hey, so-and-so is looking for jobs in New York. Can you meet with them? Um, we all meet with people to help give advice from that standpoint. But that takes time up front, right? That's that upfront prep where you got to say, hey, I want to move all the way across the country. And I don't have all of my networks are here. I don't know anybody there. You're, somebody in your network knows somebody out there. And so ask them to help make that connection. So so I think that um, really like relying on your, your current faculty, your prior sort of even trainees, right? To be honest with you, like my co-fellows, like I, we still keep in communication. You guys, I'm sure have residents that you keep with communication, right? Like reach out, be like, hey, so-and-so at your, in your division seems awesome. Can you introduce me, right? It's, it's a community. It's really a community of like, of like your people and everybody wants to meet. So, um, but the job search thing we didn't really touch on, but this is a, a really good place to start that process um, and sort of make contacts with people in a sort of less formal, more sort of informative space. This is great. We only have three minutes to la uh, left to have out of the hour. We're actually thinking maybe we'll finish early, but I'm glad that the conversation actually was pretty active and uh, hopefully useful and valuable to the people who have joined it. If you have any final questions or comments, please type them up in the chat. If not, I'll just take a final pearl or comment from everybody and then we will close. Christine, any final words? I'm going to say a um, big shout out to the MIT committee and to the training committee. Um, very proud of the work that we all do here. Um, you guys, um, this is going to be a lot of fun. Welcome back to ATS and welcome to ATS for your first time. If you guys need anything um, beforehand, the networking starts now. If you see any of us there, please say hello. If you need us beforehand, feel free. I'm just going to offer all of us. Feel free to reach out to any of us if you have any other questions that you want us to address um, beforehand. Okay. Christine David. Yeah, I think, you know, my my main thoughts here are really just, it can be very overwhelming. Just go into it with a plan. Whatever you come up with is going to be right for you. And that, you know, we're focused on like, how do you get the most out of the conference? But at the end of the day, this is also an opportunity to like see a lot of people you may not have seen in a long time, particularly because of everything that happened with COVID. And, you know, it is perfectly fine to take some time just to sort of say hi to friends and like grab a drink and like, you know, just spend time with them. Like, you know, get that sort of social part of this as well. That is perfectly reasonable. Yeah. I think it's, I mean, it's the norm. So it's like, I'll sort of echo and amplify that, right? That's part of that evening fatigue. It's you're catching up with people that you haven't seen in a long time. So I agree. I think I, I don't have much to add here. I think that um, ATS is an amazing place to call our home. Uh, I am so, so excited to be back in person. There are so many people I have not sort of seen um, since the COVID pandemic that uh, I think there's going to be a lot of energy and a lot of excitement at this meeting. And I think um, if you plan ahead, 
you'll see what is what you want to see. You're not going to see all that you want to see. Um, but really the social, the social part, the networking part, the knowledge part, um, all comes together. Um, and you're going to be tired. You're going to have fun, but you're going to be tired. Thank you. Thank you to our great group of panelists today. Thank you. A huge thank you to Lauren and the APS team on putting a webinar for us on a few weeks just before the conference with everything else that's going on. And thank you everybody for joining. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at the conference and good luck. Great afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Ciao.